Welcome to Virtual Worship with Northley United. Our mission at Northley is to love God, nurture the Spirit, connect with others, and serve the world. Thank you for joining us in worship. To learn more about us, visit our website at northleyunited.ca. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Northview United Church, and a very warm welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online today as well. Happy St. Patrick's Day to those who celebrate as well. As we begin our service, we wish to acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are very pleased to welcome back Karen Chandler this morning. Karen is a candidate for ministry in the United Church, and you can read more about Karen in her bio in the back of the bulletin. Um, and before we begin, there are just a few announcements. Um, some sad news. For those who knew a church member, Allison Symington, her sister passed away from cancer last week. And if you would like to send a message, please contact the office. The last day for Soup for Lent is this Tuesday at 12 noon in the community room. There will be two soup flavors this week, chicken noodle, and backed by popular demand, mushroom barley. And if you feel like helping them, with any luck, Sue and Joe will complete that puzzle that they've been working on over many weeks. It'll be good. With luck. Uh, and on Saturday, March 23rd, from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m., you are invited to come and celebrate Earth Hour as we gather in the narthex, turn the lights out, sit around a campfire made of candles with Josh and his guitar, and have some s'mores together and sing a few songs. So I hope you can join us for that. Uh, Sunday, March 24th, will be the last Sunday to get your Easter flower tribute donations and memorial names into the office. You can use one of the special flower donation envelopes available in the narthex, or simply submit your check noting flowers on the memo line and include a note with your contact information and the names of those you would like remembered to the office. The funds will be used to buy flowers to decorate the sanctuary on Easter Sunday. And if you'd like to help deliver those flowers to the homebound members of the congregation after the service, please contact Tricia in the office as well. And a friendly reminder to also bring in your loonies for Lent box if you haven't already in the next, uh, by next Sunday or into the office shortly thereafter. Uh, are there any announcements that I might have missed? 
Uh, I, therefore, I encourage you to look over the back of the bulletin for any other upcoming events and to check your inbox for the latest news bites for any updates on other things that are happening here at North Fleet. Please now join me for our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. Gather in, dear ones, wherever you are this morning, despite whatever doors are locked, to keep you in or out. We have found a way to be together. We are not alone. We live in God's world, and as God's people, we make a sacred commitment to open our hearts and minds to what word the Spirit might offer, and to what nudging, what questions, what grace might be given in this time. We join together in the time of worship. Please join us for uh, our gathering again, which is on page six of your bulletin.
the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. And now, in the way that you are most comfortable and able, please greet one another with the peace of Christ.
gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd was there, and they heard it, and it thundered, and others said it sounded like an angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now this is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said to show the kind of death he was going to die. In this reading, we hear God's voice. The Spirit is still speaking. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Earlier this year, I was thinking about one of the very first places that I started to work when I finished university the first time. I was about 24 years old and I worked there for a few years as an administrative assistant before I moved into human resources. But during that time, I had the distinct pleasure of working with a gentleman who wrote his way onto my heart. I'd started working for him and another manager in September of 1996. And in December that year, I sustained an injury from a cat and just to let you know, I still love cats, it's all good, but it left me with several stitches in my head, in my hair, and a long one across my face, uh, which the hospital had taped. So it would heal without too much scarring. Some days, while I knew that the scar was there, it didn't feel visible to others. And maybe it just felt visible to myself, kind of screaming at me in its own way. But the weekend that this occurred, as you can imagine, was fairly traumatic. Uh, but I went into work on Monday, feeling brave, like I can, I can do this, it's all good. But I sat at the desk, I turned on my computer, and then the floodgates opened. And I sat there, sobbing at my desk. All of these overwhelming feelings from the weekend on altercation caught up with me and he heard me crying, came out of his office, and his face sank when he saw mine, and he kneeled on the floor in front of me. This big banking executive on his knees, consoling me while I cried. He couldn't take away my hurt and the incident and how I felt. He offered no platitudes but he was present with me in my pain, and now shame, obviously, because I'm crying in the middle of the office, and I felt really embarrassed. 
He didn't ask me about the lines of tape that were on my face. But he was there for me when I was ready to share my story. I left that employer, and I missed lots of things about him. He was incredibly smart. Banking, politics. He was empathetic with staff without being cringy or clingy. He was fair, and he made the people at work feel like they were valued. He always wrote with a fountain pen. He had beautiful handwriting. It's a lost art, I think, these days. And thinking of him in this time that he was with me, I bought a fountain pen. It's a moon man. I know it sounds kind of weird. It's a moon man, hot pink fountain pen. And it refills with a piston that draws up the ink in the pen cylinder. And it's beautiful. It glides across the page and even makes my chicken scrawl look like somewhat decent handwriting. And every time I use it, I think of how he impacted my life. With indelible ink that day, he wrote on my heart. We will have people throughout our lives write on our hearts, don't we? A favorite teacher, a member of our book club, a member or two, or maybe a dozen from our church, a best boss. They leave impressions, something that changes and transforms us. And that kind of ink cannot be removed or washed away. It stays with us and becomes unforgettable. God's covenant of love is like that for us. Our connections to one another matter, each and every one of them. To other people, to animals, our environment and creation, our relationship with God matters. God's love transforms who we are, not just on the surface, but deep inside. And these transformations create hope for the future. In our reading from Jeremiah today, God speaks of a profound promise, a new covenant. No, it's not like that old one that's etched on stone tablets, but one where God's law is inscribed on our hearts and in our minds. The book of Jeremiah, if anybody has read it, it's a little gloomy, a little doomy. Lots of wars, hostile takeovers, political unrest. Does that sound familiar at all? A succession of unsuccessful kings he encountered, and Jeremiah didn't endear himself to any of them. He was ever fruitful, though, to God's call. And in Jeremiah, we hear this promise of a new covenant and the implication of a deeper, more personal understanding and adherence to God's law. It's not merely about obedience to a set of rules, but rather about an internal transformation, where the principles of God's law become ingrained within the hearts and the minds of people. When we internalize God's truth, God's law becomes woven into the very fabric of our being, guiding our thoughts, our words, and our actions. So God would make a new covenant with his people, in which his law would be written upon their hearts, and they would dedicate themselves to God's service. Perhaps the most beautiful aspect of this covenant is the promise of forgiveness. As God declares, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we receive not only forgiveness, but also freedom. Freedom from the burden of guilt and shame we may carry. Under this new covenant, we are not obeying a distant ruler. We, come, we become intimately connected with our Creator, our God, and we become God's people bound by a mutual love, understanding, and communion. 
In John's scripture, we hear that the time has now come. And Jesus says, for the Son of Man, it's time to be glorified. And it appears that these, these Greek visitors that wish to speak with him have triggered something for Jesus who has become more widely known. I wonder, had they heard about Jesus, the man who raised Lazarus from the dead? Or was it, the, or was it Jesus who healed the blind man? What about Jesus who changed water into wine? Or was it of Jesus who cleared the temple? News, stories of the miracles that Jesus performed, such as him clearing the temples, were now reaching outside the city walls. How far had news traveled of Jesus exactly? Up to this point in John, Jesus had been saying that his time had not come yet. Hold your horses, we're not there yet. The scripture reading does not say if Jesus spoke with the Greek visitors or not. However, their appearance on the scene indicated that the news of Jesus had spread. And he pulls Andrew and Philip aside and says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Do you ever wonder, did, it, did Andrew and Philip ever really kind of get what he was saying? It's tough. It's tough to sometimes get through to the heart. Were they just scratching their head? I'm not really sure, Jesus, what you're telling me right now. But I'm sure it'll make sense in time. But we know that Jesus is clearly speaking about his impending death. And it's significant. He uses this metaphor about the grain and the wheat, how it falls to the ground and it dies. In its death, it produces seeds that are able to grow and flourish. He speaks of his death as the hour of glorification and as the means by which he will draw all people to himself. And the connection between Jeremiah and John lies in the fulfillment of the new covenant promised by God through Jeremiah. Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, creates this new covenant. He is the embodiment of God's law. And through his sacrifice, his teachings become written on the hearts and minds of believers. Jesus' reference to drawing all people to himself echoes the universal knowledge of God's promise that was made in Jeremiah. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus offers forgiveness of sins and the opportunity for all people to know God, to know God intimately fulfilling prophecy. I'd like to share with you a short story adapted from Our Daily Bread, which is entitled Nuts in the Attic. A man who was born and raised in a log house visited his boyhood home after being away for 35 years. And as he walked up to this now deserted cabin he remembered that as a youngster, he had planted some walnuts along the stream that ran through the farm. He went down to the creek and he discovered a beautiful row of stately walnut trees. And then he recalled he'd also hidden some of those nuts in the attic. And he wanted to see what happened to them. So he climbed into the attic and poked around in the corner until he found them. Hmm. Those that he had stored were nothing but dry, dust-covered walnuts, while the ones he had planted by the river, by the stream, were flourishing green trees. And immediately the words of Jesus came to his mind with new meaning, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it can produce much more grain. The 
the Lord had his own death in mind when he spoke those words. But they apply to all believers as well. If we refuse to die for our own selfish desires, we remain alone. In Christ's death on the cross for sin, and in the Christian's death to his own sin, the same principle applies. In dying, there is living. From Jesus' death comes a resurrection, a love and faith in God so deep that it is like no other. For we have been given new life. In fact, each Sunday is a resurrection. We experience this new covenant of hope and rebirth as we see new buds poke out of the ground and we enter springtime. We are blessed with new life. Amen.
proclaiming the good news of salvation to all nations. Grant us the courage and wisdom to follow Christ's example of humility and service, spreading your love and grace to all in need. Many throughout the earth are suffering and in pain. They are brokenhearted and oppressed. May your comforting presence surround them, and may they find strength and healing in your unfailing love. We lift up our leaders, both spiritual and secular, that they may be guided by your spirit to govern with justice and with compassion. Grant them wisdom and discernment that they make decisions that impact the lives of so many. God, we pray for those who have yet to know your saving grace, that they may encounter the transformative power of your love through Jesus. Open their hearts to receive you and embrace the life that you offer. And now we bring before you our personal concerns and burdens. We trust in your promise to hear our prayers and answer according to your will. Grant us the courage to surrender our lives to your divine plan, knowing that you are always with us, guiding and protecting us. In this moment of silence, we bring you now those personal concerns. O oh God, as we continue in worship, may your Holy Spirit live among us, filling our hearts with joy and gratitude. May our lives be a reflection of your love and mercy, shining brightly in a world that needs your redeeming grace. All of these prayers we lift up to you, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, saying together now, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us away from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please turn to page 7 and we'll sing Glory and Cross.
God has written love on our hearts. Christ has revealed love in our world. The Spirit sends us forth to share this glorious message of love with everyone we meet.